The RCMP have a new plan to tackle online extremism. Pretending to be online extremists. Can't imagine this will backfire at all. As the RCMP is planning to conduct undercover surveillance using online fake personas. I think this is worth talking about because there's some very mixed feelings about this. Having an online presence from the RCMP to be tackling online extremism is not necessarily a bad thing. However, this very easily could wander into violating charter rights and it could also lead into entrapment enticing people into committing crimes they might not have otherwise committed. And their track record with online investigations isn't amazing. But it's also been made pretty clear in internal reports that the lack of a covert online presence is an issue for the RCMP. The program isn't necessarily a bad thing, but oversight is going to be essential. I do want to highlight this sentence because I don't know what to make of it. Federal policing national security is currently taking steps to address this recommendation through proactive legend building and backstopping personas. They're making up people, folks, and getting them ready for that cursory Google when you think, who is this person? Although they make it sound like creating a fake persona online is really complicated. Like, there will be a need for additional online personas, monikers, and information technology equipment. So, a phone and a Twitter account. And I want to be really clear here. This is a mixed opinion sort of situation. Investigating and combating online extremism is a good thing. Sweeping police powers are not. I go back and forth on this. But if you're an online wackadoo, and you find yourself with a new friend who's just super eager, they're just chilling in your DMs like, hey, you want to go commit some crimes? Probably fine. They're probably super legit. Don't worry about the mirrored sunglasses and mustache. I want to take a minute to highlight the limitless cruelty of the F. Trudeau crowd. Like, there's no belief, there's just hate. And if you want a very clear illustration of that, just have a look at this photo. A person in Calgary put out this sign and bowl saying, Sorry, we can't afford apples because of Trudeau, so this year, just razors. They literally put disposable razors in a bowl, trying to hurt children to own the libs. A couple of things. First off, why is the sign written like a child's lemonade stand? They really went freeform with the capital letters. Really, at the end of the day, this is madness. This is somebody who is deeply unwell trying to use their political beliefs to hurt children. Like, if you actually believe in making things better, and your belief in how to approach that is to trap children into grabbing a handful of razor blades, you are beyond help. Like if your politics lead you to hurt children, how do you tell yourself you're the good guy? Alberta Premier Danielle Smith, pictured here after one of her friends bought one of those tiny little Polaroid cameras from the early 2000s. You know the ones. Uh, anyways, she has survived her leadership review. And she's pulling down dictator numbers. Good for her, I guess. She got 91.5% approval from UCP supporters. So I guess those buses full of people never really materialized. And that is a resounding vote of confidence from the party. It's interesting, because when you listen to quotes about how Danielle Smith is doing, people's assessments are unbelievably generous. And she's articulate. She stands behind what she says. But she's trying, and she'll admit her faults. I, for one, would like a leader with fewer faults to admit. But here we are. Others said that we need to give her more time. Quote, nothing good happens fast. Bad things do, apparently, though. Like the NDP were only ever in power for four years. Yet somehow, everything bad that's ever happened in Alberta was isolated in those four years. Right, buddy? He agrees. And he's leaving. She said some wild stuff. Like, quote, So let us remain united as a party and as a movement, but let us not sink to the level of our opponents by attacking and vilifying one another or breaking into factions. Speaking of breaking into factions, David Parker of Take Back Alberta is not happy. So there is an upside here. He said, quote, I think she should have probably got a little bit of a worse grade, but at the end of the day, if this is how the party feels about her, this is how the party feels about her. I think people want unity right now. They don't want conflict. It's been a very hard five years for the people in this room, and they just want someone who they believe is going to be their champion. Wow, you can hear his political career ending in real time. This power broker who threatened to take down Danielle Smith, who accomplished nothing. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're both terrible, but at least one of them lost. And so when it comes to the question of now what for the UCP? It's pursuing their policy agenda. Because 35 policy resolutions passed, including one just declaring CO2's good for you. So climate change solved. CO2's good now. God help us all, Alberta. Deuces.
Hey, you remember Chip Wilson, the Lululemon guy who put up a bunch of signs calling David Eby a communist? Now, you may be wondering, why is this a photo of him and Vancouver Mayor Ken Sim holding a gigantic plaque? What if I told you, you missed an important day? Probably should have put it in your calendar. You see, October 3rd in Vancouver was very quietly declared to be Summer and Chip Wilson Day. After Chip Wilson put up the sign accusing David Eby of being a communist. But we only found out about it on Friday after Chip Wilson posted a photo himself, saying that the honor means so much to him, which is why it was kept secret, clearly. And only Ken Sims and Councillor Brian Montague showed up. No other city councillors were interested. Because it appears that the city avoided announcing it in any way to avoid bad optics. You know, it would have been a better way to avoid bad optics? Not declaring that day Chip Wilson Day. Just spitball in here. And it appears that councillors maybe didn't know about this? It appears some councillors weren't invited, and that it didn't happen in the normal way in the city hall or the chambers. And of course, don't worry, the city insists that the reason why the proclamation wasn't publicized is because they just don't publicize proclamations. It's fine. Last year, they made 100 proclamations. This year, they're on track to issue 150. Okay, cool. How many of them are about a person who called the premier a communist? Study curiosity. Because if the answer is more than zero, we should probably have a conversation. And it gets even weirder when you find out that there was no official policy around this and it was an unofficial proclamation on an ad hoc basis. So essentially, it appears that Ken Sim just decided to declare a Chip Wilson day and didn't tell anybody. Just gave Chip Wilson a plaque and said, we're cool. And Chip wore his formal sweatpants and everything. Ontario Premier Doug Ford, pictured here draining the life essence out of Ottawa Mayor Mark Sutcliffe, hates bike lanes. Boy, does he hate bike lanes. Wants them gone. Specifically, the ones on his way to work. And he'll say anything to convince you to get rid of them. Including just an outright lie. As this article from the Trillium lays out how Doug Ford claimed that 1.2% of Torontonians commute by bike, and that's nonsense. In reality, 44% of Torontonians use their bike to either work, shop, or visit friends. Which raises the obvious question of where did Doug Ford get that 1.2% number? As the transportation minister said, quote, We know that these bike lanes, where only 1.2% of people use to commute to get to work, are taking away almost 50% of the infrastructure on those streets from vehicles. Which is nuts. None of that's true. For starters, one bike lane on a four-lane street or more is not 50%. You're bad at math. But also, what if I told you that that 1.2% number was from this report, a review of bicycle facilities on metropolitan Toronto roads. And if you think this looks very old-timey, you would be correct. Because that 1.2% number is for the entire GTA, and the surveys from 1991, 33 years ago. That's the survey we're using. So essentially, Doug Ford's justification is that 33 years ago, 1.2% of people used bikes. So bike lanes gotta go! Like, come on, this is so painfully thin. Like, we get it, Doug. You don't like bikes. You've made it clear. But using an ancient survey to justify your actions is insulting to the intelligence of Ontarians. Like, come on. I want to take a second to talk about this guy, because he is a politician who I can't stand at a unique level. Because he's been a jerk to my face. See, this is Gord Wyatt, or maybe Gord Wyatt if you're nasty, trying to rebrand himself. He's running for mayor of Saskatoon. This despite spending most of the last 20 years as a member of the Sask Party cabinet, including serving for a long time as Attorney General, Justice Minister, Education Minister, a bunch of other stuff. When he was Education Minister, I sat down with him at a meeting and talked about education funding, and he looked me dead in the eyes, and he said, I'm sorry, I would love to improve education funding, but I'm powerless in the face of the Treasury Board. He omitted in that moment was that he was the chair of the Treasury Board. Powerless, obviously. And since then, I've recognized this man as a singularly untrustworthy politician. But he's got big money behind his campaign, potentially from his wealthy family. Potentially. Unclear. We'll find out later. But Gord's campaign for mayor relies on something very specific. Amnesia. For example, he's going to complain that Saskatoon has increased its taxes by 43% since 2016, and that he's the only candidate who will lower taxes. Forgetting that while he was under the SAS party government, he tripled the PST revenue over the last 10 years. So he's against increasing taxes, except the taxes he increased. Those are fun. What about crime? Crime is ruining Saskatchewan, obviously. 
is way out of hand, which is why you should probably ask the person who was one of the longest serving justice ministers and attorney generals in the province. You'd think he would have some sort of input on it, but no, he's going to say that it was in no way his fault and now he'll fix it. Crime is rising and somehow that wasn't his fault when he was justice minister. If you want to know what a uniquely terrible politician he is, just look no further than the Saskatchewan anti-trans legislation. He claims he didn't support it even though he voted in favor of it twice and didn't show up to the final vote. He just wanted plausible deniability. He's a phony! Don't vote for him, Saskatoon. I, I don't really know who you should vote for. I'm not going to endorse anybody. But what I am going to say is, not this guy! Oh, grade school never really ended for you, did it? Says the liberal. Okay, sure. Okay, couple of things. First of all, if somebody declares that I'm a liberal, they're wrong. Not a liberal. And generally, if you want to insult a leftist, liberal's a good route. We get annoyed by that, but not for the reason you think. So here's my question. Even if I did support Trudeau, which I don't, why would that disqualify me from criticizing any other politician? Genuine question. Why is the support of one politician disqualifying from criticizing any other? Like, you support Danielle Smith, I think she's a bad politician. Is everything you believe immediately discredited? Seems like a difficult way to have any sort of conversation. It's almost like you don't want to listen or learn. Just want to be angry. Hmm. So what you're telling me is that you don't want to think deeply, you just want to react and be mad. Fair enough, live your life. It's gonna be over here, I don't know, supporting Trudeau or something. Whatever it is you think I do. Okay, I feel like a broken record on this one. Stop trying to restrict political participation. Just don't do it. Like, I want you to think for a single second. If you restrict politicians to four-year degrees and that's it, you have excluded a massive portion of the population from the political system. Like, you're saying that why don't we simply have a group of educated elites who are our betters to tell us what to do on our behalf? Surely they'll understand our needs better than our own. No. Governments need to govern for the uneducated, too. And education, particularly formal education, is not the only means to access intelligence or skill or knowledge. What about somebody who is very skilled and capable but simply did not have the financial means to access a four-year degree? What then? What about somebody who works in the trades? Like, should tradespeople be, by default, disqualified from politics? Doesn't make sense to me. Like, saying you need educational qualifications to become a politician is really just saying you want to be governed by an intelligentsia elite. I don't think that's what you really want. Okay, this person's using the algorithm Taylor's version. And think that I'm very biased, and they say, show me a post that isn't biased. No, they don't exist. Show me any post that isn't biased. Like, do you think that that's possible, genuinely? Do you think that any person can fully remove all of their biases from any situation? Like, do you think that the journalists writing articles are able to fully remove their own internal biases? That they make no judgments about what to include, what not to include, whose stories to tell? Like, how do you think it is possible to be entirely neutral? Not only in what you say, but in what you include. It's not real. It's not possible. That's like demanding that I present to you a Sasquatch. It's not a thing. So what you're really saying here is that you want content that confirms your existing biases. You want stuff that confirms what you've already assumed to be true. Because the biases that you agree with seem like they're neutral. They feel that way. They're not. They're biased. Same as anyone. So why does my bias specifically bother you? Hmm. Man, if there's one thing that gets people on the internet mad, it's playing video games for fun. This person says that I think I'm owed everything while sitting in the basement playing Fortnite. Couple of things. First off, I don't play Fortnite. I get yelled at by 10 year olds enough in my day job. But also, why would me playing video games bother you? Like, genuine question, why do you care? I stream them on Twitch, I provide entertainment and attendance service, lots of people hang out and watch. Like, it's my job. Like, when I'm doing this work, I'm not drawing any public benefits or salary. I'm getting paid by Twitch subscribers, ad views. And the YouTube views, whatever it may be. So genuinely, what bothers you? Because I'm pretty sure you don't want me out in the world teaching, and you don't want me at home playing games. So what do you want me to do, specifically? Like, I know you're going to say, get a job, but this is my job. I provide a service that people exchange money for. 
So what specifically is the problem? Also, go follow me on Twitch, Steve underscore Boots. I'm playing Stardew Valley right now. I grow a mean turnip. <laughs> That's right, you've activated my trap card. You see, in Saskatchewan, we don't have daylight savings. So this is my friendly PSA to remind people that all of my stuff is going to show up an hour earlier if you're not in Saskatchewan. I ain't changing my schedule, you're the ones who were wrong. Daylight savings, lousy farmers. So yeah, I'm just going to chill here in Saskatchewan and not have to deal with pets whose routines have been disrupted by daylight savings because they don't know how clocks work. I'm going to luxuriate in my sleeping the exact same amount as I did the day before. My clocks? Untouched. Look upon my works and despair. Seriously, get rid of daylight savings. It's useless. All it does is make me have to relearn what time other people are doing stuff. But I'm not changing. You're the ones who are wrong. Help us! Somebody help us!